Welcome to the No Guilt Fangirls Podcast, where liking what you like is never a bad thing. Here's your host and head fangirl in charge, Patty Holiday. Hey y'all, I'm Patty Holiday, your host and head fangirl in charge, and this is the No Guilt Fangirls Podcast. We are talking about all things Halloween on the screen because, well, it's obvious, right? <laughs> We're rolling into Halloween next week, and I know people are looking for shows to get them in the spooky mood. Plus, there's a little nostalgia going on around this time of year, at least in this house. I like to go back and watch some of the old things, and I'm not going to lie. Disney Plus is on my brain and just around the corner, we're going to have so many cool things at our fingertips. I just can't wait. Uh, (laughs) So we're going to talk specifically about some of the Halloween stuff that's coming and and things that you can watch now or where you can find a lot of this stuff. I haven't even had a spare moment myself to sit and do a lot of Halloween watching. And uh, I think that's going to change after having this conversation uh, with uh, Ducky. Hey, Ducky, how are you? Hey, I'm good, Patty. How are you doing on the spoopiest time of year? I am enjoying it. I <laughs> the, the weather changed down here, so we're like a little cool, a little rainy. All the all the leaves have changed. Uh, until about like three years ago, I never lived anywhere with seasons. <laughs> oh well, welcome. <laughs> Enjoy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was always hot and then less hot. And so I really love that I'm living someplace where I get the full impact of fall. And so, yeah, I'm like on senses overload over here. I love, I just stare at the leaves all the time. I know that's totally bizarre, but when you came from Arizona or from Texas where the leaves don't change uh, and all you get is a bunch of brown, like it's really nice to see these cool, bright orange shades popping out everywhere. So yeah, I'm into it. I'm into it. Yeah, no, uh, <laughs> it's absolutely beautiful. And as someone who has been a uh, East Coast girl my whole life and has grown up with all the seasons, I fully uh, am very happy to see that you are embracing that and enjoying that as well. So I definitely do not think any of that is weird. Oh, good. I'm glad to hear that I'm not a big old weirdo. <laughs> I no. mean, I am. <laughs> and, it's, and it's okay that people think that I'm cool with being a little weird. But uh, but yeah, it's just it's just really funny. My husband just laughs at me because I was kicking and screaming, no, I don't want to go there. It's too cold. It's too cold. And here I am like digging in now going, I'm never leaving. I'm never leaving. Yes. I'm never- <laughs> now you can enjoy all the sweaters and all the crisp fall like weather and the leaves and the spoopiness. It's just it's all wonderful. You have to love it. It, it really, really is. Now, guys, you might remember uh, Jalen from our discussion about Downton Abbey a little while back. Yeah, uh, yeah, she's she's my friend from the <laughs> internet. <laughs> and uh, guys, she likes she likes Disney. I, I know that's like a huge shocker here. So I have a feeling that some of our discussions are going to lend themselves to that that brand as as it does here on the fangirl yeah you know what that's what we like right (laughs) (laughs) no spoiler alert it definitely is true that the disney will be involved in this discussion all right dun 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 Dun, dun, dun. Uh, (laughs) tell us a little bit about yourself and where people can find you online oh well so yes as Patty said I was on the Downton Abbey episode of the No Guilt Found Girls podcast, which was super fun. And I'm really happy to be back on the show because I love spreading all the fangirly awesomeness. But if you are curious to know where I came from, I'm mostly in the film world sphere. I write for Slash Film, LeonardMalton.com, and now I write for ComicBookResources.com and a few other websites here and there. But I'm mostly just a giant nerdy girl who loves sharing my nerdy passion about film. And I can't wait to do that here, especially about what I consider to be the most wonderful time of the year. I had a feeling that this would this was kind of your jam. Oh yeah, there was just something that came across when I met you that I was like, you know what? I bet she kind of likes likes the Halloween stuff. What what yes. is it about Halloween and this time of the year that, especially when it comes to your entertainment, that that draws you in? What 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 is it? Why is it your jam? Why is it your thing? So Halloween. It's interesting. Halloween was something that I didn't acknowledge for a really long time was my favorite holiday because as a little kid, you know, there's this sort of strange like 
aura around you to try and embrace the norm and not be the other, right? Mm -hmm. And as a kid who grew up with, you know, a variety of differences that made me different than most of the quote unquote normal kids, but you know, who is normal, right? right. Uh, <laughs> I I always felt like I had to embrace Christmas as my favorite holiday to come off like I'm just like any other regular kid when deep down I had a love of monsters and I had a love <laughs> I had a love of the macabre and the dark, you know, gothy things. So it was one of those like aspects of my childhood that I never really got until I would say, honestly, like later in my life until I was like, maybe in my 20s, did I finally like get that like, yes, Halloween is my holiday and not necessarily because I love wearing costumes, which I do and they're awesome, but mostly because I love that it's a holiday that celebrates individuality and also celebrates, um, you know, people embracing this aspect of themselves that they don't 24 seven, but then for the people that do uh, celebrate that aspect of their self 24 seven, like me, which is their own unique, authentic, like weird, loving monsters and, you know, loving uh, witches and whatnot self. It's a time where we can fully embrace that and even store celebrated too. So we can buy more things to uh, showcase that love that we have for it. Oh, I love it. I love it. Yeah. I, I you know, I how I've always liked Halloween. I can't say that it's completely my holiday. I actually mm-hmm. strange I don't know, maybe this is maybe maybe if you guys have seen some pictures of me, you can understand why I like Thanksgiving as much as I do. Any, <laughs> any excuse to eat, guys. Um, but I, I've really I've always drawn been drawn to Thanksgiving uh, for some reason, but mm-hmm. Halloween is a very close second. Uh, and I think that comes, which is, again, something that you and I share, it comes about because I love any excuse or any reason to dress up in a costume or to yes. cosplay or to Disney bound or anything like that. And I know you do a lot of that, too. Mm-hmm. And um, I think that's why Halloween has always had this mystique for me that I've I've enjoyed getting into and I've I've actually leaned into it more as an adult than I ever did as a kid, which is crazy. But I I really I, I like it. And when it comes to the movies and the TV shows, I also always really liked getting a little bit scared. I didn't like the scary where I would stay up all night and couldn't sleep for three days. Oh yeah, no, definitely not. No, <laughs> but no. but I did enjoy the stuff that I, I mean as a child, I remember uh, the girl across the street from me was the only one. This is this is gonna tell you how old I am. This is gonna tell you guys how old I am. She was the only family that had cable on our block. <laughs> oh, so she was special. She was, she was. And so we all <laughs> liked having sleepovers at her house because not only did she have cable, but her she was an only child and her parents, you know, basically let her do whatever she wanted and they never paid attention to what we were doing. So we watched <laughs> all the scary movies, especially in October because on HBO and stuff, you know, they, they ran them on a loop like all the time. I remember being exposed to like, um, Oh gosh, not not Freddy Krueger. That was a little bit later, but uh, Jason and, oh, yeah. and Friday the Thirteenth and Halloween, um, all from going over to my friend Casey's house and hanging out <laughs> in her in her family room watching these scary movies. So I've always liked the scary stuff, but those kinds of movies. Even as a kid, I recognized the, the absurdity of it, you know, and that, it, you know, it, it never quite scared me. I was always the one that laughed a little bit more than I should <laughs> over these same. slasher films, you know? Same, so, same. yeah, yeah. I, you know, I was, I was pretty young when I was doing all of that, but I, I just can tell you it just never quite um, – it, it didn't bother me. It didn't it, because I knew it was absurd and I knew it was ridiculous. And I was, I don't know, smart enough, mature enough to see that it was, but um, it was the movies that were a little bit more um, cerebral, a little bit more, 
I guess it got into your head that mm. were the actual scary ones for me. And yeah. when I think of those, I think a lot of the, the Stephen King movies, uh, a lot of those stand out back in the day for me. Because again, I was watching stuff I should not have been watching. And I know everybody, <laughs> everybody that listens to my Monday Movie Minute and she's like, wait a minute, hold up. This is the lady who's telling people not to let their 15-year-old see the Joker. And I'm like, yeah, I know. Do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> Listen, we all had to learn from our past to get to our future. Okay. Like, you know, for like, real, for real. Yeah. <laughs> but, but anyway, that being said, what I want to know what your, what, what kind of, what did you, what do you remember watching as a kid that you would still watch now? Cause for me, it's definitely anything on the Stephen King genre, anything on the Nightmare on Elm Street. I would absolutely watch any of those movies again. Um, because, and half the time, I mean, I'm smiling as I say that cause I'm already kind of laughing at some of the craziness that happens in those movies. <laughs> absolutely. Um, but then there's a couple of other, like, you know, reaching way back in there, like something wicked this way comes. Did you ever see that one? I I actually have not seen that one yet, but I've always meant to. Is that one of your favorites? That is the, one of the ones that I can vividly remember feeling uncomfortable about it when it was over. And I I mm. saw it at, at a different friend's house. This was actually we had moved somewhere else. And anyway, I saw it at a different friend's house. And I remember when it was time for me to go home, opening the door looking back at her and being like, I'm going to call you as soon as I hit my doors to make sure that I get in. So, if, you know, if you don't hear from me in 1.2 minutes, you know, call my mom. I was just so, I was so creeped out by it. And I can't remember, I don't even remember the whole storyline as to exactly what happened in that movie. I just remember it definitely mm -hmm. sitting with me, making me uncomfortable, freaking me out for the rest of the day. I, I slept fine, but I do remember having like that sense of weirdness. And this was, this was again the same age of me watching slasher films. So it's it's just that that movie had that kind of impact where the slasher films, I knew Jason wasn't going to pop out around the corner, right? But, right, right. But whatever, whatever happened in Something Wicked This Way Comes still sits with me. So it's on my list of things to watch because my one of my daughters is kind of getting into the that kind of level yes. of she wants to start watching more of those things. So I was like, all right, maybe we'll watch this one together and I'll see if it still creeps me out or not. <laughs> <laughs> that's, I mean, listen, I think that's a good barometer to have like a kid around with you and then you'll know truly like, is this actually scary or is this like at a certain time in my life scary? Yeah, I exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, so that's like on my list of old school stuff that still freak me out. But what about, what about you? It doesn't even have to freak you out. Just that you think of with Halloween that you that you want to talk about or tell me to watch because <laughs> I know we had this discussion. There is there's one series in particular that I think I aged out of it and you love it. And so I Oh yes. Well yeah. well I have many I have many, many, many things that kind of fall into that sort of um what so I as I've been using on uh, this episode, there's a word that I love that has recently come to the lexicon of pop culture, which is spoopy. And that word perfectly describes how I love Halloween, which is I aesthetically love things that are creepy and scary, mm -hmm. but I don't fully love watching things that are legitimately awfully terrifying <laughs> got it got it got it so you know like something like that for me that was definitely like an indication of the things that I would later love down the line as an adult is I am a huge 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 fan of the Disney short of uh adaptation of Sleepy Hollow oh my gosh that's like an old time <laughs> favorite too I haven't seen that one in years I need to pull that up for my kids don't you yes. think that's like a right of childhood like you have to see that I I do but it's it's very interesting to me because like for the longest time I felt like it was something that so many people saw as a child like within my age group or you know older Especially when like VHS became like a prevalent, uh, you know, format for people to watch things. And I had grown up with that short being on, I don't remember which VHS tape I had it on, but I want to say it was either like one of the uh, Disney sing along tapes or something like that. And it definitely stuck with me as this very big point of realizing that I loved 
ghost stories, but a very specific kind of ghost story, which is one set in an era in which I did not live in. Uh, Because I love that sort of whimsical fairy tale quality Mm -hmm. to stuff like Washington Irving's work. Mm -hmm. But in the way that I feel like modern ghost stories do not seem to have that same sort of like whimsical allure to them, right? Right. So uh, definitely the Disney version particularly got to me at such a young age because I think the choice to cast Bing Crosby as the narrator slash the entire like voice cast of that short is brilliant because he's one of those voices that is very warming and calm, but he also has this underbelly of being incredibly spooky. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, he has a bass in his voice that can really reach the lowest of lows and truly stick with you. And especially when you listen to the song that he sings about the headless horseman, that is possibly a hundred percent my favorite Halloween song mm-hmm. because it is so adorably catchy, but so <laughs> truly creepy because <laughs> you know it's like about like saying like you know he's gonna come and get you and chop off your head like it's such a great happy thing absolutely <laughs> totally perfect for disney watching children yeah 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 no no you know like for kids totally, totally for, for kids. kids totally for kids <laughs> totally, totally for kids so that was uh absolutely something that stuck with me but the thing i was getting at that I thought it was such a big prevalent thing in most of my generation's life, having seen that at least once, especially in my neck of the woods, because fun fact, I live only 20 minutes away from Sleepy Hollow. Oh, look at that. So, so, you know, it was part of of the lineage. I had to watch it and know about it at least once, especially since my dad is a huge history nerd. But um, the thing is, is like my most of the uh, friends of mine in my age group actually I've never seen it before and I experienced this literally last week when I went to Mickey's Not So Scary Halloween Party and when you go through the fill our magic uh scare not scare zone what am I thinking not this is a Halloween Horror Nights the The trick-or-treat the the trick-or-treat trail yeah Thank you. Thank you. The Trick or Treat Trail. They show uh, spoopy Disney movies. And one of them is Sleepy Hollow, along with the Skeleton Dance, which is my other favorite mm-hmm. of Disney Halloween fair. So did you but, did you did you watch the um the new castle show? I did, and that was also something I'm gonna add to my spoopy list for sure. It's really, really good. I can't decide though, by the way, if I like it more though than the Halloween version of Wishes. I yeah, I I don't know. I'm not I don't I'm not precious when it comes to Halloween. Well to any I not not just Halloween, to any of the uh, firework shows. So, yeah, same. But I, but I liked this one. I thought the projections were really pretty cool, and that the skeleton, the skeletons are the ones that jumped out at me. I was like, "Holy cow! Look at what they're doing over there!" They're pretty cool. I know it was a. It's actually again like talking about Disney and spoopy things. It was really cool to see that show because they do such a really interesting job of showing all of the little historical aspects of Disney's history that involve with horror. And I thought they did a really nice job of kind of sprinkling that in into like the, its own little genres and categories, especially with like, you know, the they had the dancing skeletons. They had Jack obviously hosting the show. That sort of thing definitely struck me as like, Oh wow, like the imagineers are actually paying attention when doing this show. <laughs> so yeah, no, it was that was really awesome. Um, but yeah, so when it comes to the spooky things I love that come from specifically Disney, like I said, Sleepy Hollow, Skeleton Dance, those kind of early era Disney stuff where they weren't as afraid to not the like they weren't trying to hold back. You know, they were going like full on with the spooks as much as they Mm -hmm, could for kids. mm -hmm. That sort of thing was definitely my vibe. But in a similar vein, that is why my favorite TV series of all time happens to fall into that category of Disney spookiness. And that is Gargoyles. 
which will actually be on Disney Plus. So it's relevant to your uh, love of Disney Plus. Yeah. And to tie this even one step back, didn't you do a cosplay for that for D23 Expo? I did. And to tie it in even further, I rewore it at Mickey's Not So Scary <laughs> Halloween Party. So, yeah. So, um, if you don't know anything about Gargoyles. Which I don't. So tell me the tell me the plot because I, I, I'm i going to watch it because you keep talking about it. And you were right. When you said – when we were talking about Disney Plus the last time, we did this off mic. When we were talking about Disney Plus last time, you mentioned Gargoyles. And I was like, I don't know what that is. And you are like, what? The whole internet's going crazy over the fact that Gargoyles – where are, where have you been, Patty? And I'm like, all right. <laughs> uh, so I went and I looked. And you were you were 100% correct. It was all over the place. I People your age were all super psyched about Gargoyles. And so – it was on my list to do some research on it, but my list is like out the window because things have been crazy around here. So that's why I have you to <laughs> tell me, uh, this is your moment, sell me on Gargoyles. Tell me why I want to watch this. <laughs> all right. Let me let me get my pitch readiness right. <laughs> all set. Uh, all right. So Gargoyles, first of all, is created by a wonderful gentleman named Greg Wiseman. And if you are at all a fan of Young Justice of things like the, I believe it was the Amazing Spider-Man TV series that was on MTV and a myriad of other very nerdy stuff, then you will know uh, Craig Wiseman's work because he is um, a master of the nerdy cool stuff. He came up with the idea for this show because of another Disney afternoon show that had come out at the time called Gummy Bears. And (laughs) he wanted to do a version of Gummy Bears that was a little bit more, mm, I would say a a tiny smidge more masculine and with a little more action than Gummy Mm -hmm, Bears mm -hmm. had. And that is what came and spawned uh, Gargoyles. So Gargoyles is the story of a group of, as the title says, Gargoyles, that are creatures that essentially are kind of like humanoid monster type uh, beings who originally came from Scotland and they were existing around like the uh, medieval Renaissance era, I would say. And they at one point are betrayed by their human clan or their human group of friends, let's say, and are cursed forever to to sleep in stone because that's what they do when the sun uh, comes up. They turn into stone and the curse is broken a thousand years later when they are risen above the clouds by being put on a skyscraper in New York City in modern day mm, New York City. Okay. Which modern day New York City is 1995, but we'll we'll say it's modern. <laughs> okay, it's it's modern for this 90s girl. So especially because I live and go to New York City every day, so it still feels pretty much the same. Um, so the the draw of this show very similar to actually an article I wrote about for your website, uh, Beauty and the Beast, the Mm -hmm. 80s version. Which is is really, really good. So if you guys haven't read that yet, I'm going to throw that link in here, even though it really doesn't have anything to do with Halloween, just because I want to make sure you guys go read it. It was a really good one. Go read this one. Well, I will say it does a little bit to do with Halloween only because it has an amazing Halloween episode. But I'll get to that <laughs> at some point later on. Um, but anyway, the, the allure of the show is that it mixes Shakespearean sort of storytelling and actual legit Shakespearean things like Puck, Midsummer mm-hmm, Night's Dream, mm-hmm. yada, yada, yada. That sort of magical stuff. But with the grit and grime of okay. New York City. And... At the center of it is a character named Goliath, who is voiced by the incredible Keith David, who has one of the most beautiful, sultry voices. You'll probably know him as the voice of Dr. Facilier from Ah, Princess and the Frog. Okay, okay, yeah. Yes. So, and, you know, 
little asterisk on that. Goliath slash Keith David was one of my first crushes <laughs> when I was a kid because I thought Goliath was like the bee's knees, but also like, oh my God, that voice is amazing. And even at like six years old, I'm like, I don't know why, but this voice is just the coolest voice and I never want to stop <laughs> listening to it. But um, the, uh, yeah, so Goliath is at the center of the series along with a human character named Elisa Maza. And Elisa Maza is a half Native American half African American character and she was one of the first non-white female character lead characters in an animated series and that's a really big deal and she happened to be in a not explicitly but a obviously romantic relationship with Goliath and a lot of people that love the series Love it for that aspect, along with the other gargoyle characters who, funny enough, a majority of them are voiced by the cast of Star Trek The Next Generation. So if you love that, you might like this show because there's a lot of familiar voices. That's fun. So uh, overall tone of the show, is it is it spooky? Is it funny? Is it a little of everything? Like what what's the tone of this? I would say the tone of the show is a little bit everything. It's I would say it's most like a more grounded and serious Teenage Mutant okay. Ninja Turtles. And I think that's kind of what Disney was going for at the time. But then it became the most mature thing Disney had ever made at that point. Uh, it talks about racism. It talks about gun control. It talks about, you know, lots of really big topics for a kid for, show. For a that at that time, five kid show. Like that's, yes, I mean, exactly. I, it's, it's so insane for me to think 1995 was as long ago as it was, but it really, you know, we're getting up there in, in time here. And that really was a, a while's back. And uh, things have changed so much in what we, what we talk about, what's, what our kids are interested in, what they want to talk about. Uh, you know, my daughter definitely has a whole different grasp and view on things like racism and um, acceptance and inclusion and such that none of those words were even in my lexicon as a kid. It, we just, it wasn't part of, it wasn't part of it. So that's kind of interesting uh, that Disney was ahead of the curve way back then doing something like this. I Have you seen... Have you seen anything? Have you seen any of this show recently? Like, I'm just wondering if you, if your thoughts are like, has it held up? Does it still stand? So I actually rewatched the entire series from beginning to end on an oh, annual well, okay. basis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it is, and in my opinion, it definitely holds up. The only thing that I'm, I'm going to be very curious to hear the reaction from people as they watch it that haven't watched it as consistently as I have is the animation. Uh, there are some episodes in the series that are so beautifully animated. They look like they're animated today because they, some of the episodes were outsourced to companies that were Mm -hmm, anime mm -hmm. companies, uh, in Japan. And then some of them were outsourced to other animation studios and the quality in certain episodes is very drastically different from other ones. So I'm very curious to see how people react to that. But in terms of storytelling, I honestly think it is one of the most ahead of its time TV shows. It feels like it could have been created today. And there are lots of wonderful episodes that you definitely need to check out on Disney Plus that definitely go with Halloween and go with any time of the season. There is one particular episode that is an actual Halloween episode where one of the characters who's a human character turns into a Mm -hmm. werewolf and there and Elisa and Goliath have to go and basically track this character down and figure out what's going on with them during Halloween. And there is a wonderful sequence that a lot of people that remember the show love this moment that Elisa is dressed up as Belle from Beauty and the Beast and her and Goliath get to dance together. Ah. And it's very sweet. Yeah, so that and also the other gargoyle characters who normally don't get to come out, you know, in public get to because they everyone thinks they're in a costume and not, you know, these freakishly weird supernatural creatures that came out. Well, I love it. I love it. Okay, so you've sold me. You've sold me. 
I, I, I'm, yeah. I'm going to have to. I'm going to have to watch that. Uh, <laughs> what yes. What else? Yes. Um, maybe more recently, do you like? Like for me, there is no way that this month goes by without watching The Descendants. I know it's like super, super recent, and and but it. I love it so much. It has everything that I love in a show. It's got a little bit of evil, a little bit of good. It's got some good interactions. It's got some fun acting. It's got the dancing and the singing it's it's my everything i am all about the descendants uh also all about high school musical which i think this is like the spooky version of that um <laughs> <laughs> yes definitely, so uh, definitely. that's my that's like my current uh thing i know i know everybody loves hocus pocus hocus pocus is not yes. my idea dislike hocus pocus in a bazillion different ways and reasons why but uh so it's not my thing i can skip hocus pocus however i can't skip the descendants i have to watch that (laughs) well and for me i am the opposite because i have grown up with hocus pocus as being a very important part of my childhood for Mm -hmm, just as long mm -hmm. as gargoyles has been but at the same time unlike gargoyles i can definitely see that for me, Hocus Pocus is one of those things that you had to have grown up at a very specific time and seen it at a very specific age for it to kind of click for you and also be into a very specific kind of humor, which for me, I've grown up with, you know, Bette Midler and First Wives Club and Drag Queens and Carol Burnett and all these ridiculous things being a huge part of my life. So, Loving Hocus Pocus kind of falls into that category with the asterisk that I know it doesn't necessarily hold up from a moral standpoint Wait, that's it. anymore. I think, I, and I honestly, you, you, I mean, you nailed it. That's exactly what the problem is. I I didn't see it yeah. when I was younger um, because whenever it came out, yep. I was the a different age. I was off doing other things, and so I did not see it when it came out. Right, and um. Therefore, it, it it's I I mean, guys, I watched it for the first time last October. It was that mm-hmm. recently that I finally got around to watching uh, the show <laughs> that everybody has just you know raved and loved and and just you know enamored over. And when I watch it, I think I got through the first fifteen minutes the first time and was like, I can't watch this. This is crap, you know. And I turned it off. And then one of my friends is like, No, no, you got to keep watching it. You got to keep watching it. So I was like, Oh, okay, I'll try. So then I tried to keep watching it, and I still couldn't get through it. And then finally, I did get all the way through it on the third try. And the whole time I was like, I let my daughters watch this. Like, <laughs> what was I thinking? Uh, because it's not. It's it's just not. It's not a good. It's it's not a good moral show. Not everything I let my kids watch is. But this one did strike me as odd because so many people are so in love with it and are so f- fanatical about it. So I think that's where like the disconnect yeah. for me was. Yeah. No. And I think again, I, I definitely. And one of those people, unlike a lot of my friends who are very like, no, it's either you love Hocus Pocus or you don't. But I love Hocus Pocus with the acknowledgement that from a historical, you know, cultural perspective, things have Mm -hmm. changed significantly from when that movie came out, when it comes to talking about certain things with certain people who like black flame candles and, you know, certain things like that, that it, it definitely has not aged mm-hmm. well in that sense. But in other ways, I feel like it's aged well in the sense that the the special effects still look amazing. The casting is still great. And as someone who is a really big fan of people like Jason Marston, who's the voice of Zachary Banks, and of Doug Jones, who played the zombie Billy Butcherson in the movie, I love seeing those people in that moment in time and them reflecting on how much their career has continued to grow from that point, you know, and now Doug Jones was in the monster Mm -hmm. in the shape of water, the Academy award winning film. And Jason Marston is also the voice of Max Mm. goof from a goofy movie. So, you know, there's lots of these things that are really interesting to see, where I started to love them from Hocus Pocus and how that love of that movie kind of reached into further mm-hmm, things mm-hmm. I loved as an adult. So yeah, that's sort of thing. 
in terms of other things I love that are spoopy but are a bit more modern, uh, my favorite movie that I'm actually writing about right now that is of the spoopy category and kind of relating back to mentioning Shape of Water is Guillermo del Toro's yeah, Crimson he, He's your guy. You, you, yeah, he's your guy. Yes. <laughs> Uh, Guillermo del Toro is my hero. I actually met him about, te- oh my God, it's almost going to be 10 years ago now. Ah, <laughs> crazy how time flies. And uh, he gave oh, me the best hug of my awesome. life. Yes. Yes. And it was during when he was signing for the okay. Strain book series. And I was one of the last people in line at the now defunct borders <laughs> on Columbus Avenue or or Columbus Circle. And he was just one of the nicest people on the planet. And the fact that after signing books for, I'm going to say at least three or 400 people, he had a good 10 minute long conversation with me about film and about at the time I was in college about my film career and just Wanting to give me any sort mm-hmm. of moment of recognition was really magical. And then I ended Aww. up crying and he ended up hugging me. And it was like <laughs> a big deal. So, yeah. No, and then, and again, he, he is, it's interesting to talk about why I love Halloween because I love that Halloween celebrates mm-hmm, people mm-hmm. who are the other, right? And Guillermo del Toro and his films mm-hmm. celebrate the other. All of his films have at the center of it, someone who is misunderstood. And Crimson Peak, in a lot of ways, has that because the lead central character is a girl named Edith, whose last name is Cushing, which, by the way, if you don't realize, that is the also the last name of a famous horror actor, Peter Cushing, who also was in Star Wars. <laughs> That's a whole other very nerdy tangent. But the fact that Guillermo named her that last name is just a chef kiss. (laughs) Beautiful. Um, So the, but this lead central character, Edith is someone who loves writing ghost stories and horror stories. And no one really appreciates her for that because at the time that she's writing them is the turn of the century. And women are not appreciated for having thoughts other than children. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And as someone who has grown up in a, world where I've wanted to be accepted for loving all different kinds of things that are the other, like monsters, like fairy tales, like creepy things. It's wonderful to have a character that you connect with like Edith or like any of the other characters in his films that honestly, all of his movies are great for Halloween, but especially Crimson Peak because it essentially is the movie he wanted to make of the Haunted Mansion that he never got to. Yes. So if you love Haunted Mansion, if you love Tom Hiddleston, Mm -hmm. like a certain friend of yours that was on a prior episode, then Crimson Peak is definitely the movie for you, 100%. But I will say, since we always talk about, like, should kids watch it, it's very violent. So I wouldn't necessarily recommend it for anyone younger than... Uh, 13 okay fair, fair yes um i i personally think even though the film's rated r i do not find the things in it to be that gruesome it's more the notion of them that is gruesome for some people but yes i definitely think it is absolutely a film you should see if you love any of those things and um, yeah, I know. I, I, think I, I love them all. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And then I will just say one other spoopy thing that is a little more recent that I highly recommend everyone watch because it's on Netflix. So if you got Netflix, you just a click away is a little TV show that unfortunately only got picked up for one season called The Curious Creations of Christine McConnell. Have you ever heard of that show? I... It's like ringing a bell, but I, 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 but I don't remember it. So no, I mean, yes, but no, I, I kind of remember, I remember the name. So tell me a little, refresh my memory. Tell me a little bit more about this. The Curious Creations of Christine McConnell is a series that is essentially horror meets Martha Stewart. 
And it is a girl who got very popular on Instagram and on YouTube for making these absolutely beautiful kind of like cakes and uh, DIY stuff that is based on horror and goth stuff and all the kind of creepy crawly things you love during Halloween, but she makes it beautiful and intricate and gorgeous. But the really cool thing about the show is it's a DIY, you know, learn how to do things kind of show, but with the guys that she also lives in a creepy house that is filled with Jim Henson creature shop made monsters. If you love things like Pee Wee's Playhouse, if you mm-hmm, love mm-hmm. things like, um, you know, uh, The Crypt Keeper or Tales from the Crypt or, you know, Goosebumps, but you also love Martha Stewart and Rachel Ray, this is totally <laughs> the thing for you. Uh, this sounds like the ultimate mashup. <laughs> yes, it is. It is. And honestly, it is one of those things that, you know, for some people, they want to put the Yule log on during Christmas. This has become my new Halloween version of the Yule Log. Got it. Got it. I love it. I love it. Okay. Yes. Okay. And when did this come out? This came out last year and unfortunately it did not get enough people watching it. So they didn't pick it up for a second season, which is so sad because it is just perfection to me. Absolute perfection. Well, I am but- definitely intrigued. Yeah. I know I had heard something so, like when you started describing it, I was like, oh, that's ringing some bells, but but not enough to have I can't say I watched it because I know I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you you totally should. And then if you do like it, she just is coming out with her own sort of like down on a budget version of it on YouTube mm-hmm, that is mm-hmm. crowdsourced. Okay. So if you love it and you want to support her, I highly recommend just looking up Christine McConnell anything on YouTube or Instagram or whatever. It will absolutely give you inspiration for the season. Well, awesome. Awesome. Now, on that note, we have we have so many things to go back and watch and uh, get into this whole Halloween-ness of it all. We don't have that much left in the, in the rest of the month. And then we're going to roll on into my favorite time of the year, which is building up for Thanksgiving. Because I, <laughs> I I love everything. I, and I think it's just because Thanksgiving feels like so extra, extra fall to me. Yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, and I was I was raised in Texas. So of course, that also meant football. And it, it just kind of everything like comes together in November. So uh, I am I'm not ready to throw away October. Don't worry, Halloween people. There's still plenty of things to watch. I want to also point out, I have a couple of posts uh, that the folks might want to go check out. One of them is over 70 of the best Halloween movies. Um, I have a whole big list. And so if you're looking for something different, looking for something new, go check that out. And then the other one that I have is basically movies that are not so scary. So these, I put this list together for the, the tween teens that I had in mind who are not so much wanting to go trick or treat anymore, but they want to hang out with their friends in the basement and watch a scary movie. But of course, Nothing too scary because I am not going to let them do what I did (laughs) Uh, because, uh, you know, my parents didn't know I was doing all of that back then. So I'm trying to be a little bit better uh, parentally uh, in control here. Uh, But these are like, you know, things kind of like, you know, is something wicked this way comes the watcher um, escape to Witch Mountain, you know, that kind of stuff. That's what no, that's awesome. Yeah, that's where I'm leaning towards. So it's like just spooky and just kind of fun enough. So um, if you have a list, uh, Ducky, if you have anything else that you want to send to me to add to that list, I will make sure that they get included as well. But guys, I'm going to link that in the show notes if you're interested in finding some more fun stuff. I'll also make a link to all of these things that we've talked about. So it'll be really easy for you to just click on over to whatever it is that you need to get to to uh, to watch these shows and uh Thanks. This has been fun. This was a, this is a great, great episode. And I so appreciate you coming on again. Oh, well, thank you for inviting me, Patty. It was wonderful. And I hope everyone that's listening has a happy Halloween. Yes, yes. Thank you. Uh, and as always, everybody, thanks for listening. Um, please leave those uh, iTunes reviews, those five stars. It helps other fangirls find us. And we like to fangirl with lots of people because it's no fun, right? It's no fun to do this alone. You got to have. Oh, yeah. No. You got to have, gotta have the, the friends in the community. And so we're looking for that. So everybody, please 
do us a favor, share this to like-minded friends, let them get in on the conversation and uh, come fangirl with us again real soon. Uh, See you again. Thanks, Ducky. Thank you. Bye.